Okay, I think we'll, uh, I think that seems pretty settled. So yes, welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Daisy, I work at MQ and I'm hosting the webinar. Um, so today we've got three fantastic panelists and we're gonna be talking about the importance of nature to our mental health. Um, I said it before, but please talk about this event on social media, use the hashtag MQ Open Mind and tag us at MQ Mental Health. Um, use the Q&A functions to ask questions. We'll get to that at the end of the webinar. And also we will um, uh, feel free to use the chat function as well. So today we're going to be talking about nature and mental health. And I'm sure we've all experienced firsthand the well-being boost that comes with spending time in nature, whether that's going for an awe-inspiring walk, cycling through the countryside or reading a book in the garden. We can all benefit from spending more time outdoors. During the pandemic, the need for nature has been more prevalent than ever. More than 40% of people surveyed by the Office for National Statistics say nature, wildlife and visiting local green spaces has been even more important to their well-being uh, since the restrictions began. Green spaces have helped bring people together during the pandemic and allow friends and families to meet when they wouldn't be able to indoors. Um, so now we're starting to come out of lockdown, it may be that people will continue to value nature on a much greater level than before the pandemic. But this also highlights some social inequalities that exist with access to green spaces. So I'm joined by three fantastic panellists today. Um, so if you'd like to just take turns to introduce yourself, starting with Dr Jennifer Wilde. Hi, my name's Jennifer Wilde and I'm based at the University of Oxford and I research post-traumatic stress disorder. Brilliant. And Catherine? Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Seymour, and I'm Head of Research at the Mental Health Foundation. And Lee? Hi, I'm Lee Timmis. I've cycled around the world. I'm a world record holding ultra endurance cyclist, and I'm an ambassador for MQ. Brilliant. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, so we're going to start by asking each of you to talk briefly about the mental health benefits of connecting, of us connecting with nature. So Catherine, would you mind starting us off? Happy to, thanks Daisy. So I, I'd start by saying that nature has powerful benefits for our mental health and it's brilliant that this is the topic for today's webinar. It's great to have the opportunity to explore this topic in more, in more detail. So I'm delighted to be here to talk about that. I want to start by saying a little bit about Mental Health Awareness Week. This is um, uh, the Awareness Week that um, Mental Health Foundation runs every year. It is uh, nearly always in the early part of May and this year was our 20, 21st year. Every year has a theme and this year the theme that we chose was nature. And that's because the finding, that's because of the findings that we we heard during our, our, our pandemic survey. So throughout the pandemic, we, we've had a, um, a monthly survey going out to, uh, to people across the UK. And something that we heard loud and clear through that survey was um, that spending time outdoors, spending time in nature was the most common way that people told us they used to cope with the stress of the pandemic. And a, a lot of the time that might've been because it was the only thing available to us, but actually, it was the only thing available and it, nature is a constant in our lives and it really felt like during the pandemic there was an opportunity that uh, opportunity for us to reconnect and re-establish our relationship with nature and this isn't a new thing you know, we are human beings we're animals and we are we're part of nature uh, and it's only really over the last few decades and few centuries that we've become as detached as we are from nature so this is it's quite natural that we, um, that we have a close relationship and can benefit from spending time in nature. It really felt, it felt like focusing on nature for Mental Health Awareness Week resonated with, um, with many people across the UK. In preparation for the week, we did a review of the evidence that demonstrates the connection between nature and mental health. And, and, and there, were, there were three key findings from that that I wanted to, to set out at the beginning here. Firstly, which is around the benefits. So, we know that spending time in nature can reduce stress and anxiety, it improves our mood, and that's something that, as well as, as, as being demonstrated through, um, through studies, people recognise themselves. We, most people know that, that going outside, spending time, out, spending time outdoors and in fresh air is good for us. Instinctively, we know it. As, as well as improving our mood, 
spending time in nature can also induce feelings of awe and wonder and to help it can it can help us to solve problems it can even make us feel less lonely because we get a sense of being part of something bigger than ourselves and bigger than our own problems bigger than our uh, bigger than the, sort of the sum of our everyday life we know that quality is really important ideally we spend time in nature spaces that are green and serene and biodiverse and biodiverse basically means a good variety of plants and good and good variety of animals so grass a patch of grass is lovely but actually if you've got somewhere with trees and with shrubbery and with a water a element of water all those things are going to lead to biodiversity and that's going to be even better for us so quality is important the second point is about our relationship with nature. So there's, there is some evidence to suggest that a certain threshold of time needs to be met so that we benefit most, get the most in terms of mental health benefits and spending time outdoors. But actually recent studies suggest that we should pay more attention to our connection with nature when we're outside than with the amount of time that we spend. And what that means is when we spend time in nature, really, noticing and appreciating what's going on around us and we can use all five senses when we spend time in nature as well as just looking around us we can uh, we can hear bird song and we can smell the different smells in nature whether that's the smell of the soil after it's just rained or, or plants and trees and, and flowers that are blossoming um, and, and we can also touch the bark of trees so it's a very it's a very sensual experience and we can it can make us feel very much in the moment it's quite a can be quite a mindful experience so really that relationship with nature is all about when we go and spend time in nature it's not just getting a dose of it we need to unplug leave your phone in your pocket don't don't listen to a podcast we are going for a walk really look around you hear what you can hear and use all your senses to appreciate it and that's that's where most the most mental health benefits are in really noticing and, and having that connection. And then the third point is that everyone can benefit. So going out in nature is best because if we go out, there are other mental health and physical health benefits from doing that. We're taking exercise. The air quality is likely to be to be better when we're out in nature. But if you can't go out, there are still plenty of ways that you can get the mental health benefits and thinking very much about our relationship with nature find ways of bringing nature to you. So if you can have a bird feeder in your garden, that's fantastic. You can watch and see the birds, uh, but houseplants, growing herbs at home, all these things are ways of connecting with nature. And, and even if you can't do that, watching nature documentaries has been shown to, in, to provide mental health benefits by improving our connection, our relationship with nature. So it's something that everyone can get the mental health benefits from no matter where you are, how mobile you are or what your circumstances are. So it really is, it's, it's, it's a great um, uh, preventative solution for everyone. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Jennifer, is there anything that you want to add to that about the benefits of spending time in nature? Thank you, I was on mute. Thank you, Catherine, that was a really wonderful summary. Um, I think one of the reasons why nature is so helpful is because it gets us out of our head. And as Catherine touched on, it really helps us to engage in, in the five senses. What we see is very different to a computer screen. What we start to think about is very different to the repetitive negative thoughts that we might have about particular problems in our lives. And it's much easier to get out of our head when we're in nature, we can listen to bird song, we can touch the tree bark, we can notice the flowers blossoming. Um, I think all of this helps to shift our focus of attention from being quite self-focused to being externally focused. And we know that when our attention is outside of our heads and we're more externally focused, we have reductions in stress and we feel much more connected with the bigger picture in life. And I think that's one of the reasons why being outside in nature is so incredibly helpful, as well as the exercise benefits that Catherine touched on. I think that's really important. And I, I guess I just wanted to say as well, um, not everybody has access to green spaces for sure and, and living in urban socially deprived areas it's very difficult uh, it is possible not just looking at documentaries but even looking at uh, photos of nature can be helpful but um, do try to get to a park um, because 
research shows that getting into a park, living close to a park, being in a park, uh, reduces anxiety and depression much more so than people who are unable to do that. Brilliant. Thank you. And Lee, is there anything you want to add from your own experiences here? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, it's really interesting just listening to Catherine and Jennifer's um, answers that there's so many things from the scientific side that I feel, you know, I don't have that scientific knowledge of mental health. I've got the lived experience and the things that I've done in traveling the world have kind of almost used those examples, but in the real world. So I wanted to kind of start by, um, by telling you a question that I was asked recently by an eight year old girl. I was in a, um, doing a presentation in a school and at the end they put their hands up and this girl asked the most prolific question. You know, you can speak to corporates and like these amazing minds in the world, but children have just got it. And she just asked, um, where did you meet the happiest people in the world? And I thought that was, it was such a deep and honest question. And I couldn't answer it straight away. I ended up having to leave it till the end and have a bit of a think about it because it wasn't defined by where you lived or um, the job that you had or the country that you happened to be born in. Um, I ended up defining it by the the lifestyle of the people that I met. So I kind of realized that out in the world, um, the happiest people that I've met tended to have this amount of wealth that was not so little that they had something to loot, that they, uh, that they were starving or that they didn't have the necessities of life. And it wasn't so much that they were afraid of losing it. Um, and they lived in communities with normally quite a few people, maybe a whole family in a house, and they worked together outside doing manual work in nature. And I think that there's a lot of what we need as human beings all within that description. Um, so for my personal experience of kind of nourishing those needs, when I traveled around the world, I think there's kind of two sides of what I saw that I brought home with me. One side was that as human beings, we span this planet and we have this amazing network of people who are there supporting each other. We're in every corner of the world. And no matter where I went, I was invited into the home of a stranger in every country that I went to. 51 different countries I was invited in. And it was that kindness and generosity and the way that I got to experience the world through those strangers that got me around. There was no way that I'd been able to get around the world without the kindness that I was brought from people that just met me on the road. Um, so to see that, you know, as this human network, we can achieve such amazing things together. But on the other side of that, those intimate experiences with the people of the world were punctuated by these huge adventures, like crossing the most extreme environments in the world, whether it was the highest mountains or the most vast deserts or sailing across oceans. And in those moments, you realize, I guess in, in a lot of ways, that was my connection with, with nature, that you realize how small you are, how insignificant some of those anxieties and worries might be, and also how much power you've got. Like there were moments in the middle of Tibet where I knew I was on my own, nobody knew where I was, and I was relying upon myself for um, cooking, for finding shelter, for getting myself out of any situation that might come along just with my own skills and the tools that I carried um, and the knowledge that I had. I also kind of realized that at every junction that you come to, whether it's a junction in the road or a junction in life, you, you have control of where you go. And I think that's something that's really important. Um, so within those situations, I had this very a tangible connection with the world. I liked the way that Catherine was talking about being, humans being, being animals out there, human beings as animals, um, and using all of those five senses and being connected to something bigger than ourselves. That was definitely what I experienced, you know, um, foraging for food or having encounters with wild animals, filtering water and bathing in rivers and even going back to something that I think is really important, which was waking with the sunrise and going to bed with the sunset. 
um, this connection to the world was so rich and so uh, direct in so many ways. And these um, experiences seem so adventurous. They, they seem like it's a wild, you know, face to face with a bear or sailing across an ocean. Surely that is so extreme. But within those situations, I never felt as overwhelmed as I have done in society, you know, with the pressures that we face just every day in, uh, in what we call normal life. So kind of bringing all of that back, I feel like those things that I went through, the experiences and that connection of nature relating to my happiness, it doesn't have to be just connected to these wild endurance expeditions. I think that we can all get that just on, for me, like a local club ride on a Sunday, going out with my friends. Um, you get to cycle outdoors, you meet new people, you're at your own pace in nature. You, you either connect with the sun or the rain more often in England, and you're out there in nature seeing new horizons. And, you know, we're getting all of that through nature just from getting outside, you know, that, that really is where I find my happiness. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so Lee, coming back to you again. So you've already sort of touched on this already, but you uh, mentioned that you cycle around the world for seven years. Could you talk a little bit about your mental health journey and how you came to do this challenge? Because it's just so exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I guess I was always into bikes. Um, I've got pictures of me as a kid, growing up on a bike, and then I remember getting a BMX. We grew up, me and my sister grew up on a building site. My dad was building the house here, and I remember building tracks around the garden or uh, using bricks and bits of wood to build ramps. That was like, that was childhood. Um, and it was kind of an escape as well, you know, to ride a bike. I'd finish school, come home, get my bike, and go across town and meet my friends. I had a really interesting conversation with somebody recently, a friend of mine's trained to be a counselor or psychologist. And she asked me to describe a peak experience. What are my peak experiences in life? And thinking back through it, those peak experiences weren't to do with getting, getting a world record or finishing cycling around the world or, or getting a certificate. They were connected to, well, the one that I came up with actually was this moment where I'd cycled across town to go and see my friends and we just learned tricks in the woods. You know those moments where the sun's just coming down and it's like that, that dappled sunlight through the canopy of trees and the dust's getting kicked up under the tires. We're charging down hills. We're learning jumps and tricks. We get to the bottom of the hill. We high five each other. It's amazing. We go and watch some bike videos. For me, that was childhood. And in a lot of ways, it's that escape from childhood pressures and the the pressures of home, my parents were getting divorced, there was a lot of stuff going on. And that was an amazing escape. Continued doing that through till university. Um, but then I kind of got confused. I think many of us get confused between pleasing ourselves and pleasing others. And I figured out this recipe for success at university where to get the best grades, I just had to tick the boxes for the marking criteria. So went through that and I got the best grade in my year, got a first class degree, came out from that, became a self-employed filmmaker, which is quite different to being a cyclist. You're, you're stuck in a dark editing room or, uh, or lecturing in uh, local schools, not being outdoors doing the things that I wanted to. And I'd given up cycling by this point to pursue success. And I used that same way of ticking the marking criteria at university, I used it to tick the expectations of society. So earn a lot of money, get the respect of your peers, um, working for the government and for local filmmakers and doing everything that you're supposed to. But I neglected the things that were important to me. And I ended up struggling with depression at that time. The only way that I saw of getting out of it was to take on more work not realizing that the things that mattered were family and friends and doing what I loved, all the things that I'd neglected in this pursuit of success. Ended up going to counseling, but through counseling, I, I was in my early to mid twenties and I couldn't bring myself to do the work that they asked of me. I thought that I'd go there and we'd have this conversation. There'd be some, uh, 
some silver bullet where they'd say, okay, you've gone through this and that. If I just tell you this now, everything's going to be fine. But it wasn't like that. You know, you've got to look at those like dark corners, those real troubled areas of your own character and start to figure them out for yourself. And at that age, I just wasn't, I was either not capable or not brave enough to look into it. And so I kind of deferred these conversations to discussions of philosophy. I'd be like, oh yeah, well, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and this and that, and yeah, I understand that. And, but never applying it to myself, never going home and doing homework. Anyway, through that time, I got the opportunity to go to Iceland on a motorbike with two guys that I worked with at a learning center. And um, it opened my eyes to a world that I never thought was meant for me. So we went off, we got a boat from Aberdeen, we sailed up to Iceland, we got off and rode our motorbikes up onto like the shoulder of the island and looked out onto this amazing world of volcanic deserts, just black deserts for as far as the eye can see, and then volcanoes and glaciers. And we spent a week, two weeks, motorcycling off-road through this, it was like the pages of National Geographic, it was wonderful. Like sleeping under these volcanoes, swimming in rivers of hot water, walking across glaciers, camping under the midnight sun. And I was alive. This was a world that was never meant for me. I'm not an adventurer. How am I out here doing this? And it changed my life completely. It was this catalyst for, for the life that I live now. When I looked back and I just thought, why would I go back to that life that isn't pleasing me? It's causing all of these problems when there's this world out there for me. And from that moment, I went back and within six weeks, I'd finished everything, sold up, and I'd moved to New Zealand by it. Like, there was just that quick. Um, and that, that was the moment that changed everything for me, which is a direct connection to my relationship with nature, actually. Never really thought of that before. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so now moving on to you, Jennifer. Your research specialises in trauma. Could you talk, talk to us a little bit about um, what the research says about connecting, how connecting with nature can help people with PTSD or other mental health problems? Sure. I mean, I, I think connecting with nature is helpful for post-traumatic stress and depression, which often um, comes together with post-traumatic stress. But of course, depression can develop on its own after trauma. And it's also helpful for anxiety. And as I was saying before, I think you know, when I'm working with people who have post-traumatic stress, one of the things that happens is there's a real kind of anxiety and withdrawal from going outside because people may feel that they'll be attacked again or, or even if it's not an assault, that something bad will happen, that another trauma will happen. And so they very much learn to go outside in a way where they're scanning for danger. So they're not really a going out very much or when they are outside, they're really looking for signs of danger. And the paradox of that is that when we are scanning for danger, we actually feel more anxious. So part of what we do in our cognitive therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder would be to help people what we call reclaim or rebuild their lives. And part of that is about going back outside, but to do something quite differently. And instead of scanning for danger, we really want people to get lost in the environment. And so in nature, that really would be coming back to what Catherine was saying and really focusing on what you can hear, what you can see, what you can smell, rather than what dangerous thing might happen to me. So really focusing on what you can see, hear, smell, taste. Um, and so in that sense, it's helpful for both post-traumatic stress. It helps people to realize, actually, I can drop some of my safety-seeking behaviors. I can drop the over-checking. I actually feel less anxious. I can actually go out and I can go out again in life and start to enjoy being out and about again without this fear of being attacked because I've shifted my focus of attention, dropped some safety behaviors. For depression, being out in nature, um, one of the ways, what the research is currently showing, which Catherine also touched on, is that when we go out in nature and we go um, with the intention of experiencing awe, so with the outright outlook, awe um, can be found anywhere. And when we go out with that intention and we look for it, um, we experience even more benefits from being in nature than if we just go for a walk in nature, which has its own benefits. But the, you know, going out in nature and with the expectation and looking for awe helps to um, increase levels of joy helps to improve pro-social behaviors and emotion, 
and helps people uh, smile more. So they have a, a bigger smile intensity. And this is research conducted by Virginia Sturm last year. And the other um, finding linked to that study, which I found so fascinating, is that at, so at the beginning of the study, Virginia and her team trained um, 60 people, 30 people were given the instruction to go out walking every day and to experience awe and the other group were told to go out and, and walk. And so the, the group that were experiencing awe over time and to take photographs when they were out and over time, they were taking much bigger photos of nature, much smaller photos of themselves. So they interpreted this finding as suggesting that when we're out in nature and we're out in nature regularly, we they researched the the intensity of their smile, which got bigger over time, the more they were walking in nature with awe. And they also noticed that they became much smaller in their pictures. So their photographs were much more full of nature and with them only inhabiting a little bit of the photo. So that was suggesting to them that um, big smile, small self, it's one of the benefits of walking in nature and experiencing awe. And so that, um, that can be helpful for any mental health problem in terms of being able to um, get a bit of relief from the, the anxiety and the distress associated with mental health problems such as depression and PTSD and anxiety, um, that sense of awe and um, being outside of your house and, and recognizing that you're part of a bigger picture. And I think that helps to reduce some of the anxiety that um, comes with the distress associated with mental health problems. So I think that was some of the research I wanted to touch on. And just finally, I'll just mention another study which I always find reassuring and for people who have anxiety about public speaking, for example, which um, is another mental health problem, social anxiety disorder. Um, research shows that if you go out for a walk in nature and you do a little bit of exercise on that walk, so like a brisk walk in nature, on the day that you have a memory test, and a memory test might be doing a talk, you're going to perform much better than if you hadn't gone for the walk beforehand. So just to kind of um, heads up, uh, walking can be very helpful for anxiety and public speaking as well. Brilliant, thank you. And um, yes, Jennifer, I, I read the same about the same study with the all walks. And ever since then, whenever I'm on a walk, I'm like, right, where's my all moment? I'm looking out for it because, yeah, it really does make a difference. I, I thought it was such exciting research. Oh, Lee, you've unmuted. Do you want to add something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it just it links in really well with something that I heard recently just from a lived experience, um, not, not me at all. Um, somebody that I was working with, they were having problems and this might apply to a lot of people at the moment, that anxiety of returning to work. Um, this one was a little girl, again, who was going back to school. And on the, on the way to school, she was very worried about what's it going to be like going back to my class after COVID? What's, is, is everyone else going to be sick? What's everyone else been doing? I think we've all got these anxieties about what groups will be like or whether we've still got the abilities that we used to have or how we'll fit in again. Um, and the parents ended up asking for advice. And one of the things that was suggested was to use a bike or use the scooter to go to school, because instead of sitting in the back of the car, ruminating on what could be happening, what might go on in the future, what's gonna happen in that class, who am I? She was focused on riding the bike. And that's what Catherine was saying about absorbing all of those senses. You know, you're listening to the birds, you're smelling the coffee at the bakery or whatever on your way and you're becoming a part of your environment. And it's that, what Jennifer was talking about, that, that awe as well, like go through the park, watch what's going on all around you. And apparently she arrived at school, hadn't even thought about COVID. All her friends were there playing in the playground straight away, getting involved, bang, back at school, no problems. I just think it's, it's amazing that a bit of nature and a bit of exercise can distract us maybe, or, or just change our mindset to cope, cope with things in a better way. I think it, it brings our attention out of our head and into the environment, um, which is where it needs to be in order to reduce distress and anxiety. I think so that little girl sounded very absorbed in her environment and then therefore she couldn't give those anxious thoughts lots of attention. Uh, I definitely think like a child, so that would work. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I'm going to pass a question over to Catherine now. So I, I think it wouldn't be right to talk about access to green spaces without talking about inequalities and connection to nature. Um, could you talk a little bit about people who find it harder to um, access green spaces, nature spaces, and what can be done about this? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and just before I go on to that, I, I love the idea of, um, of all walks and, the, and smile intensity. And I think both those studies that, um, that Jennifer mentioned, both, both the smile, the one about smile intensity and also um, brisk walk reducing uh, anxiety levels and, and leading to better performance. There's just some great practical tips that we can take from that as well. Um, but to talk to talk more about um, in, inequality, so it is it, it's something that was very much at the forefront of the the work that we've done around mental health awareness week this year it, it is is understanding what um, uh, what access is like for different groups in within the population, and it is a, it's a cruel irony that. People, generally people who are most at risk of developing mental health problems are actually least likely to have easy access to, to what we think of as high quality nature spaces. So for instance, people who are living in poverty are often in inner city housing developments who don't have gardens um, or peaceful safe parks on their doorsteps. They're also less likely to have private transport to, to travel to those places where, where those sorts of nature spaces do exist. Um, our survey found that more than one in 10 people who are living in deprived communities say that they find it very hard to spend time in nature. We also know that people who've experienced racism are least likely to access nature spaces. National parks say that less than 1% of visitors to national parks in the UK are from BAME groups. And that's, that's against a 13% um, um, segment of the population. So, you know, that, that number needs to increase 13% by 13, 13 times to actually be representative um, of the UK population. So there's a, a lot of work to do there. And, and, and women and older people as well are more likely to say that they don't feel that nature spaces are, are places they can, they can spend time in comfortably, whether that's because of safety concerns or, or physical access problems. And our, our research found that one in four women say they don't always feel safe in green spaces. So you know, when we look at the very people who've most to gain from the mental health benefits of spending time in nature, um, they're the least, often the least likely to, to get those benefits. And given that there is this ability of nature to transform our mental health in so many different ways, we want everyone to reap the rewards of, of nature. Um, and, and that should be, nature is nature's this free renewable resource if we look after it properly. So you know, making sure that every member of the population has access to nature for a variety of reasons. But when we're thinking about our mental health, this is a fantastic way of, um, of support, helping us support our mental health. So equal access is really, really important. Thinking about what we can do about that. So 75% of people who responded to our, our survey about nature and mental health said that they, they felt it was the government's place to do more to help everyone enjoy nature. So we need to pr protect and promote green spaces and to make them places where people from all walks of life like to and want to and are able to spend time. And that, that's how we'll maximize this, um, this amazing source of, um, uh, of, of, of support to our mental health and nature. We can start by investing in the spaces that we already have to make those space, that make them safe and pleasant. Um, the reasons that people are sometimes put off from spending time in a local park or a nature space is things like litter, uh, if they're badly lit, if they look uncared for, they don't feel like spaces that we want to spend time in. Good biodiversity, I mentioned earlier, is really important to people wanting to spend time, spending longer, visiting more frequently, and the mental health benefits that they can um, derive from those spaces. So we've already got green spaces, let's make them the best they can be. Let's prioritise spaces that are closest to um, and within deprived communities. Nature is a really low cost option prevention. So actually investment goes a really long way. And secondly, there's more that we can do to create more nature spaces. So urban planning should emphasize nature more. Um, there's some really great work done on um, urban planning and how to integrate nature into where we go already. So thinking about, um, as an example, where people spend time, even if they're not going out looking for nature, but people spend time um, it, waiting for buses at bus stops. So there's some great examples of making bus stops into really lovely nature settings. So whilst we're there just waiting for our bus, we're enjoying the benefits of being around nature without having to try. Um, 
you know, the, the, the journeys we already take, whether that's taking our children to school or walking to the shops, um, integrating nature into that are really good ways of bringing nature to where people are. Uh, and, and even in very urban areas, there can be surprising amounts of, um, of, of, of nature. Uh, the, the other thing to mention is um, that there's a lot that local authorities can do when thinking about nature spaces within local areas to harness the power of communities. So nature is, um, nature is something that volunteer, people often want to volunteer their time to support. It, it's, it's a great place to spend time if you want to volunteer on something because you're in the outdoors. And also it's, it's hyper-local. People often feel very passionate and very engaged about their own local nature space. So this is something that I think local authorities can really tap into and harness more to improve and promote those green spaces is to work with the people who want to use that space. And that way we'll have spaces that meet the needs of, of, of local residents and, um, and the people who live, live local to those spaces. Brilliant, thank you so much. So we've, this has come up already sort of multiple times so far in the webinar about the importance of being sort of aware of your surroundings and being sort of present in the moment rather than sort of looking in on yourself. Um, so Lee, could you share some of your experiences perhaps from your travels um, about when you've been very much sort of in the moment and those sort of mindful uh, moments? Yeah. Um, like I said, I think a lot of it has been touched on that. Um, finding, you know, I guess what, uh, using a lot of punctuation, not a lot of words though, aren't I? Um, the more that I learn about what I've struggled with, anxiety and depression, the more I've realised it's, it's that um, ruminating on the past and it's worrying about the future, it's not being in the moment. Um, strangely, didn't really struggle with that at all, going around the world. Um, I think one of the things was the fact that there wasn't a lot of distraction. You know, I left in 2010 when um, the first iPhone had been out for less than a year, probably. So I left at the end of this era where we weren't permanently connected. And I went off and lived in a tent, basically, for seven years, um, where I did utilise every sense. That seems to have come up a lot. And every day was spent on this journey of awe, just seeing the most wonderful places in the world. Um, I was very much immersed in the moment all the time, from that moment when I woke up in a tent, which was normally, I normally tried to place it in a beautiful area, so it'd be in the mountains or in a forest, next to a river, somewhere where had access to water, maybe I'd put a fire the night before, slept under the stars, somewhere beautiful, um, and get up and just wonder, you know, about those basic things. So where was I going to find water that day? Who was I going to meet? Where was I going to get food? I think that they were really um, important aspects, you know, to, um, to strip life back to its basics. Um, I feel like it's a really interesting metaphor that every time I came to a mountain, I had to lose as many burdens as I could, you know, when you're carrying everything that you need for life and you've got to push it up a hill, you'll have a look at how many books you really need or how many pairs of socks you really need to carry. Like you'll lose as much baggage as you possibly can. I think that there was definitely a lot of physical and maybe metaphorical baggage that I got rid of along the way. Um, and also kind of using that mountain metaphor, um, I probably looked at the world in a different way as well. You know, you can easily become overwhelmed by challenges that seem so big. Um, it's like looking at the top of a mountain, but when you break those challenges down to just looking at a map of where you can get to by the end of that day, or if that even seems too big, just looking at maybe getting to that next corner and then I'll reassess what I'm gonna do. Chunking down those big challenges um, was definitely a way that I kind of resolved some some mental health problems, maybe grew a bit of mental strength as well. Um, and being on the bike was kind of in itself like a meditation. You know, you're just riding a bike, you're focusing on that repetition, that cycling, the breathing. And it gave me a lot of time to, um, to consider things as well. Not so much in that ruminating, but more questioning, 
like you might do in meditation. You know, how have I got to where I am now? Who do I want to be? What are the things that I'm grateful for? Who are the people who have impacted my life? I think having that time, it's almost, it was almost a seven year punctuation in my life where I got to assess how I'd got to that point and who I wanted to be. It was really important for me. Um, there was another thing as well about um, every day I had to step out of my comfort zone, which is something that I still feel, you know, when you get into a routine, it's very easy to become overwhelmed or you feel like doing something new might start, uh, you might start to look stupid or you might um, not, I don't know, you might not be the person that you wanted to be, you can very easily slip into um, habits. And going around the world, I had to challenge myself every day, whether it was a physical challenge or whether it was going into a, a supermarket or a bakery or meeting somebody in the market and not being able to speak the language. Um, and just, you know, sometimes going back to that childlike state of just gesturing of like, point that cake and then at my mouth or like can I sleep here or can I, I've got a little tent can I put it in your garden these kinds of things it was that simplicity maybe it was that stripping back of life that just made everything so much easier so much more in the moment um and again I guess it all sounds extreme you know you don't but you don't have to be going out around the world maybe I just put myself in situations where I had to um i had to address things like that but actually we can make those choices at home you know i went away without a phone you could just leave the house without a phone or turn it on to silent um i threw things out of my bags when i didn't want to carry them maybe there's stuff you're just holding on to and you could just get rid of it as well um i ended up trying to figure out how to put those round the world adventure lessons back into normal life when i came back as well and it came down to a lot of things like, yeah, tidying your room, scheduling your, your time, going to bed on time. Like, they're, they're all difficult choices. They're all difficult things to do, but they can be made easier and they can be made easier by going outside as well. Brilliant. Thank you. I don't know if Jennifer or Catherine, either of you want to add a little bit. I know you've touched on this already before about focusing on the surroundings. Um, if not, we can move on to the next question. Um, so the next one's um, for you, Jennifer. You've already touched on this before, but could you let us know about um, some current or recent studies that particularly excite you around mental health and nature? Yes, so um, I, I think that, I think I have touched on this before, haven't I? So the um, study looking at awe and helping to facilitate the experience of awe when going on for going for a walk. So going for a walk is beneficial for mental health and you can take it one step further and increase the experience of joy by um, looking for the wonder in the world and looking for experiences of awe, looking for, you know, how a bee hunts for pollen, for example, and the challenges like the little insects face. Um, I think that's really important. And I, I think, um, you know, when we increase the sense of joy, we also increase the sense of optimism. So we're activating the left prefrontal cortex and we're potentially more compassionate to ourselves. And compassion is very important in terms of helping to reduce anxiety and feel more on top of, you know, what's going on in your life and feel more able to manage some of those challenges. So I think that all study by Virginia Sturm, which was published last year, um, is a good one. Then I, I mentioned another study which looked at living near a park and how that's really helpful um, for mental health. Um, so that's important. And I, there's another study um, which I really loved and it's, it's, looking, it's looked at Japanese forest bathing. So it's called forest bathing. So it's this concept of just immersing yourself in nature and how this helps to improve well-being. And on the, the back end of that research, there was a study looking at looking at photos of nature and how that can help to improve well-being as well. Improving well-being is, is helpful, obviously, for mental health. So that's what I'd like to add. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and now a question for Catherine. Um, so circling back to um, Mental Health Awareness Week, um, uh, lots of people interacting with the theme of nature. Um, and what did you hear from the public about um, their relationship with nature and mental health? I'm sure many of the things we've spoken about already, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean mostly the, the, the theme really resonated with people. 
um, and, and that reflected our, our, our findings from our pandemic work that um, people have really discovered their connection with nature over the last, last 14 months. Um, we provide, we, we, on our website, we've, we've still got, but, but we launched in the week, practical resources to give people ideas of how to connect with nature. Um, and that really seemed to, um, to appeal to people that, um, you know, actually we want, we want ideas of how to, how to go out and I think it's a little bit like the, the all walks. We want, we want to know how to, how to do it in a way that's really going to be good for our mental health. Um, and and our, our social channels have lots of feedback from people who are trying these ideas out. Uh, we, we heard back from lots of different ways in which people connect with nature. So we, and we heard a great range. You know, we, we heard from people who uh, really enjoy wild swimming. We heard from people who like to connect with nature by spending time in the local park, playing football with their friends. Um, and people who, who, who were forest bathers uh, or like just to take solitary early morning walks and really found that that, that set them up for the day. We set, we set people a challenge of going out in nature every day during the seven days of Mental Health Awareness Week and noticing three things in nature and noting those down. And this was inspired by a study that looked at, um, what well, we looked at exactly that, people, people going out and spending time in nature and noting three things. Um, and then that, that group of people was compared to a group who had to notice three things, but they were quite functional things. So noting down what they had for lunch, for instance. And, um, and the study found that after even a week, um, those people who spent time noticing things outside in nature um, had better mental health outcomes. And that, that improved, up, 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 well, the study was for three months. So there were, there were increases from a week to a month to three months. So we, we set this challenge for people to start doing that and to tell us how it was going. Um, and, and we got great feedback. Even after a few days, people um, noticed that they found it easier to spot things in nature to notice and, or appreciate. Um, and one of the things that we heard that I really, really liked was that even in the seven days of one week in May, every day was different. So there's some things, some, some trees or plants came into bud perhaps on day four that weren't there on day three. Um, you know, the, going out at different times of the day, so the same nature space smells different depending on um, you know, the, the, sort of the, normal, the more 24 hour cycle of nature and whether it had rained or whether it had been a sunny day. So I, I think that, that that really struck me that even if you go to the same place, it's different every single time. And that was just, you know, people notice that within the same week. If you think about the course of a year when the seasons change and the weather really changes, it's, um, there's always something new to see. There's always some change to spot. And I think nature has this really lovely ability to um, stay the same and be very dependable, but always also always changing. So you know perhaps that, that that tree that you like is always going to be there, but every day it's going to be subtly different. And a project that um, I, I did with my children in lockdown but actually you can do it anytime and it doesn't have to be with children. We went to our, it was a way of me getting them out of the house on a daily basis. We went to our local park and we adopted, well, each of them adopted a tree. So that was their tree for the next few months. And each day we would go and take a photo of that tree. We would um, do bark rubbings of that tree. We collect some leaves or twigs that had fallen from that tree and go home and make collages or um, flower pots out of them and that was their tree so that was a really special tree and and for me this is a way of getting them out of the house and um, you know, having a purpose every day when that was all we could do but I think it the more the more I've, I've worked on this on this this theme the more I understand that this is actually about creating that relationship and um, and, and they, they felt that they had a connection to that tree a personal connection and so I, and I think that's what we found has been, has really appealed to people during Mental Health Awareness Week is some practical examples like that of, of ways that you can improve your relationship with nature um, and ideas that you can take off the shelf and, and go out and do. In particular, we, we, produ well, we produced a schools pack and in particular that was very popular with primary schools um, and, and was downloaded multiple times for use in schools. We found that that was less popular or it was just used less by secondary schools and that's something that um, 
I, I think really needs, needs some work because enjoying time outside is seen as the job of primary schools. I'm not sure it's seen as much as the job of secondary schools. And we know that there is this, what's known as a, an adolescent dip. So we, we, nearly every age group appreciates spending time in nature, um, but teenagers see that connection less. And actually we tend to spend less time in nature when we are teenagers, and then that increases again when we're in our 20s and 30s and so on. But we know that teenagers have, many teenagers have particularly, um, particular needs for their mental health. And we were talking about nature as a, a sort of general preventative mechanism and a way of, of, of supporting our mental health. So it's definitely something that teenagers can benefit from. So for us, this means thinking about what resources can we target particularly at teenagers um, who, who really need the benefits of, of nature to their mental health as well as other age groups. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, and this question's for Jennifer. Um, obviously we've discussed at length all the mental health benefits from spending more time in nature, but obviously it's not a silver bullet. Um, could you talk a bit about the nuances of mental illness and why it's not as simple as just going for a walk to overcome a mental health problem? Absolutely not. So when people are suffering from anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, um, there are a number of factors that maintain that particular psychological problem. And I think going for a walk in nature can boost mood and it can shift our focus of attention and it can give some relief from the mental health problem. But ultimately, it's not going to change um, people's beliefs they may have about themselves. That's going to, which is obviously very relevant for um, depression in particular. That's going to need some more targeted treatments. So the way people think about themselves that maintains depression and often post-traumatic stress isn't going to change naturally just by going for a walk, but they will feel a boost in mood. Um, so it's not, yeah, it's, it's not a cure-all. It's definitely a step in the right direction and it's something that can definitely support treatment gains going out in nature. And in terms of post-traumatic stress, it's part of that rebuilding or reclaiming your life. But even within that component of therapy, that's not the only thing that one would do in treatment. So we would look at all of the, the other um, factors that are keeping the, the distress going and target those. So very important, but definitely it's not gonna cure everything. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and just to sum up um, from each of you, if you could briefly um, give us a few practical tips for everyone that's here today about how they can make the most of, um, uh, how they can make the most to improve their relationship with uh, nature and um, boost their well-being. So maybe starting with you, Lee, if that's all right. Sure, yeah. Um... Are you going to say cycle around the world? <laughs> oh, come on, let's go. <laughs> we can all do it. <laughs> I've got loads of bikes in this house. Just come round. Um, I think for me, it's um, it's not forcing it. You know, I think that you watch a webinar or you listen to the news, and we all know that the world will be a better place if we exercise more, or we should do this and you should do that. But it's just about enjoying it. It's about finding a way that it works for you. Like, Someone told, told me to go for a walk, but ugh, walks are boring. But if you say we're going for a treasure hunt and there's a cake at the end, I'm in. Like that's, you just got to know my hooks. It's food, it's cakes. Um, also for me, um, I find that I've got to form habits. Like I could be as motivated, I could be the most motivated person in the world, but until something becomes a habit, I'll just slip out of it. And I'll slip back into the old ones, you know, the cakes come back and the cycling goes out. And I've just got to keep, maintain those good ones. And it, I find that habits kind of come together as well. So um, sleep and eating and exercise, they're the ones for me. If one of them goes, the other ones tend to slip as well. And then it all ends up in this bundle of mess and I've got to try and climb the mountain to get back on top of it all. Um, and the final thing that, that helps me is, um, getting outside with friends. You know, through the lockdown, it was the only opportunity I got to see my mum actually. So spending time going for a walk with mum was great. And we didn't let each other down because we knew that we'd be out there going on the walk on our own otherwise. And it's the same for me on the weekend with the cycling club. If it's raining outside on Saturday morning, I'll get up and I'll look at the weather and I'm like, I'll just stay in bed. But if I know that my friends are waiting for me in the car park five miles down the road, I'll make the effort to go out. And once you get out there, you realize that you only get wet once. Like you're out there 
enjoying more than just the walk or the bike ride. You're enjoying the company. You're enjoying that time and space on your own um, and all the benefits that we've discussed today. So they'd be the three things. Don't force it, enjoy it. Um, tag it onto another habit and do it with friends. Thank you. And how about you, Catherine? Uh, those, I mean, those are great tips. I think I, um, because I live in London, I'm going to give some city specific tips. So That's very I'm going to say, wherever you, whenever you go out, look for nature. If you look for it, you'll find it. And, and nature, nature has a really great way of forcing itself wherever it can. So look for nature and you'll find it in the most surprising places. You might see um, daisies or dandelions growing through cracks in the pavement or on on the verges. If you look, um, even if you're going, going to the local shops, you might see hanging baskets outside shops. There's lots of places where, where nature likes to be. And, and look up, you know, I, I think often when we walk around, we, we walk with quite a fixed purpose. If you look up, you're much more likely, particularly at this time of year, to see the canopies of trees that, um, that are coming into blossom right now. And there's an awful lot in a city that happens above our, our island. So definitely, definitely look up. And, um, and if you're going somewhere where there is nature all around you, try to switch off from anything else. So keep your phone in your pocket. Uh, don't plug yourself into headphones. Really try and, um, and use those five senses. Brilliant, thank you. And Jennifer? Yeah, I love that look up. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I would say that it's important to uh, plan when you're going to go in nature. So it can be really easy to get very absorbed in your working day or um, your day at home and not actually go outside. So make sure that when you're looking at your week or when you're looking at the next day that you plan when you go out. I often look at the weather forecast and I figure out when in the day I can nip out for at least seven minutes. So I try to get out. It doesn't sound very long, but it's enough to shift thinking and, and start to focus on the outside world. And I, I also think the, the next tip um, is really important, and that's to look for life when you're outside. So um, it's wonderful to look at trees and the beauty of flowers. So you're looking at beauty and flowers, but, but also look at the, the challenges insects face or the bees um, or butterflies or moths fluttering around. I think it's fascinating to get absorbed in their world for a few minutes um, and that brings us out of our own troubles. So um, look up. I really like that um, one from Catherine. Schedule when you um, are going to go out in nature, maybe look at your weather forecast and figure out when in the day you can nip out and then look for life uh, in nature as well as the beauty that's more obvious. I love your seven minutes, Jennifer. Sometimes 10 minutes does feel unachievable, but seven minutes just makes it just feel, you know, we can all manage seven minutes. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, everyone. So now we're gonna do a few questions um, from our audience. So it's a question from Jane. Um, I think people have become more playful when we're in nature. We might swing on a branch, jump on a stream, try to use stepping stones, pick up a stick and play with it, skim stones, etc. Does nature reboot us a bit like going back to factory settings? So I guess this is asking about like play and nature and mental health. Perhaps uh, Jennifer, you'd like to talk about this? I love that idea of playing in nature. I think that's brilliant. Um, yes, I mean, if it's possible for you're in a nature surrounding kind of like the one behind me, then it's much more possible to do things like that, especially if there's water. A little bit different in a park, unless like there's a quite a vast park with water. I can see you doing that in Hyde Park, potentially, if there's some water there, if you don't hit the swans um, with skipping stones. Um, but yeah, playfulness. Playfulness is much more likely to kind of connect you to joy and that's going to help you to feel more optimistic and reduce distress in your life. I really like that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and then we've got one from Daniel that says, um, do you think that the power of immersing ourselves in natural spaces is amplified by our growing dependence on digital spaces? So I'm not sure who'd want to take that sort of technology versus nature and our mental health. Oh, Catherine's unmuted herself. <laughs> I'm happy to say something in response to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think there definitely is the correlation there, and I I wonder um, how much of that has played a part in our experience of nature during the pandemic as well, when so much of our work and socialising um, and connection with other people has had to be through a screen. Actually, that has made us really enjoy the benefits of nature more. I know from personal experience during the pandemic, I've really <laughs> appreciated being able to look into the distance when I'm outside 
because so much of our lives have been inside and you're seeing very short distances. Uh, but when you're out in nature, a lot of the time you're looking far into the distance and that, you know, that is, um, that's just a lovely antidote to sitting still and, and, and having screens. So I, 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 think, I think there definitely is a correlation. I think what we really need to do is, is hold on to that feeling of, um, of how much we enjoy nature and how different a feeling that is to when we're um, cooped up in our own homes and only being able to use a screen to connect with the outside world and, and use nature much more in the future. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so this is a question for Lee. Um, I spent most of my 20s waiting for someone to give me a magic pill or the answer to cure my depression. After 10 years, over 10 years, I realised my recovery had to be something I drove myself. Um, was there a particular point where you realised chasing success wasn't making you happy or was it a slow realisation? It's a dilemma, that one. Um, you know, Even the easy ones for you. <laughs> <laughs> I had this great metaphor that was taught to me um, by a French backpacker. I was on the edge of the desert before I went up into Tibet. We spent a month together um, kind of talking philosophy in this hotel room. And he told me that life serves you lessons like dishes in a restaurant. And if you don't learn the first time, it's served again spicier. And it serves spicier and spicier until you have to learn that lesson. Um, and I think I'm just getting to that spiciest dish at the moment, you know. Um, the first class degree wasn't good enough for me. The riding around the world wasn't good enough. I had to go and break a world record. That didn't end up being enough. I've ended up trying to write a book. In writing the book, um, I've gone over a lot of my experiences in life and realized that I wasn't chasing what I thought I was chasing. You know, I don't think we're very often chasing the achievement. Um, what on, so the world record across Europe was 16 days. On day 13, I think, 12 maybe, everything fell apart. And I got out of the motor home with the team grabbed the bike, said one thing to the team that morning. I said, I'm never going to do anything that impresses me. And I cycled away. My expectation, I'd, I'd let go of my expectations. I wasn't going to hit what I thought I was going to. Um, and for two hours, that went through my mind. You know, what, what was that? That wasn't just about this morning. That was about more than this. It's about more than the record. It was, it was about life. And what have I been chasing? After a couple of hours, I stopped the team, asked them to get out the motorhome, turn it off, had something to say. And I realized that I wasn't gonna be in that moment again. I, I was only gonna do that world record once and I was tired of being this athletic robot that had to perform on demand. I was tired of being analyzed. And I realized that I just wanted to be human. I just wanted to be loved. And that's actually all that I was pursuing through all of these different achievements. No matter what it was, I just wanted to be good enough to value myself, enough to be loved, to, to be valued enough to be loved. Um, and it's something that I think I still struggle with. You know, it's something that um, is so integral to me that it's put, so it, it defines me too much. Um, and I, there's definitely an element within that of if I let go of it, if I let go of trying to achieve, trying to be better, Will I let go of that part of my identity that's achieved so much that I, I define myself by? And I kind of wanted to bring this back to something that Jennifer was talking about earlier, about self-compassion, because that seems to have popped up in my life quite a lot recently. And I wondered if you had any tips on how to achieve greater self-compassion. How do you show yourself that, that self-love, that gratitude? Um, would you like me to answer that question? Yeah, okay. I'll leave it on a cliffhanger for everyone who's listening. <laughs> Tune in next week to find out. No, go for it. It's a really important, a really yeah, important. It's really, thing. it's tough, isn't it? It's tough. 
compassionate. So um, the uh, first step in self-compassion is to be compassionate towards somebody else because having kind thoughts about somebody else can make it easier to have kind thoughts about yourself. You know, if you go through something that you're really judging yourself very negatively for, um, think about how you would um, speak to a friend if they had been through the same experience. Would you speak to them with the same critical, harsh voice? Or would you have a more balanced view that would be more nurturing, more compassionate? So I always say to the people I'm working with, if, if you're struggling to speak to yourself with kindness, think about speaking to somebody else with kindness. Um, or even speaking to a child that would come quite naturally, you'd be naturally kind when speaking to a child. And then the act of being kind to somebody else makes it a little bit easier to be kind to yourself. And I think also, you know, recognizing that harsh self-criticism doesn't and actually improve performance doesn't act make you feel better it doesn't make you perform better next time so um recognizing that actually it can maintain distress and a bit of anxiety and um, discomfort can be one step in um, using that as a cue to think kind thoughts about something else, somebody else which can then help you to think more kind of thoughts to yourself so that might be one way to begin the self-compassion discuss yeah i love that there's a lot of things, you know, I struggle with a lot of my thought processes. I, I'm taking time to um, to meditate at the moment, just taking uh, five to 10 minutes in the morning and focusing on breathing and I'm aware of the thoughts that come in and my automatic way of reacting to them was, all right, we don't need those thoughts. I like, get out of my mind, I'm meditating, <laughs> which was the whole, uh, like the opposite reason of why I was there, you know, disrupting this calm. So I've started to, to kind of talk to my own mind, these thoughts that come in, has been grateful for them. I'm glad that you reminded me of my to-do tasks for the rest of the day, but right now I'm just having a moment to focus on my breathing. Um, so it's, yeah, it's quite, it's a strange one to become aware of these natural reactions that, um, that maybe, you know, previously I've thought, you know, there's one way of me getting through this world and it's my way, you can't change that. But actually you, you don't die the person that you were born. You have changes every day. You're constantly in transformation. And you do have control over some of those transformations that you make as well. Um, so that's really interesting for me. On that um, idea of happiness as well, I'd like to do another world record. And I wondered if instead of pursuing the achievement, what if you pursue happiness? And, and just through doing that, will you get a greater achievement at the end? I feel like that is quite a bold philosophical <laughs> question and maybe not something that we're going to quite be able to round up in the next five minutes of this webinar. Um, Sounds like a topic just, for future webinar though. Yeah, I feel like that's a webinar topic in itself. <laughs> um, so we've got a question from Matt um, who is asking for book recommendations. So anything for the general reader around nature and mental health. Um, I'm not sure, Catherine, do you have any recommendations? Um, I'm terrible at remembering um, what I've read, but I will, um, uh, I, I, so there's some podcasts which I have enjoyed. Um, there's one called, uh, I'm reaching for my phone now because I've got my podcast app here, called um, Natural Health Service, uh, which is all about mm. the benefits of nature to our physical and mental health, and that's a good that's a good one to, um, uh, to listen to, but don't listen to it when you're out enjoying nature because you should be focusing on nature. So this is one to maybe do, maybe listen to while you're doing the ironing or doing something that keeps you in the house um, and then go outside and um, enjoy the benefits of nature fully. I've, um, I've got a book recommendation. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, no, because of my screen, but it's called Be Extraordinary. And it's a book that I've written, um, Seven Key Skills to Transform Your Life from Ordinary to Extraordinary. And there are several, in several of the chapters in that book, it talks about um, how to connect with nature, why it's important, and how to bring some of the um, benefits of being in nature into your life in a very simple way. So that might be one helpful read. Amazing, thank you. Brilliant. Um, and then we've got time for one last question. Um, we have some Fiona who said, this all sounds very interesting and thank you. Um, I've completed an MBSR course in the past. It sounds like mindfulness principles and mindfulness may be easier in nature. Um, I'm not sure who'd like to answer that. I'm happy to start off. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, I mean, I think, I think spending time in nature is a form of mindfulness. I think, um, you know, I think you can, you can practice mindfulness in nature, but actually spending time in nature is in itself mindfulness. And I, I think um, that's a lot of the philosophy behind the Japanese forest bathing is that you are very present in the moment and you're switched on only to what's in your immediate surroundings and everything else is, is, is secondary to that. So, um, so I, think, I think the two are very, are very connected. Um, and, for the, and for those who uh, really enjoy mindfulness or feel that they can really get benefits from mindfulness, actually spending time in, in nature is a great way of extending that mindfulness practice. Yeah, I, I would add to that. And I would say when you're spending time in nature, you want to be mindful. Um, and that's somewhat the point of accessing the benefits. You want to mindfully be walking and noticing what's around you. And that, that is a form of um, walking meditation uh, in Zen Buddhism, but um, really being mindful to what's around you, walking mindfully, um, that touches on meditation and mindfulness. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so yeah, all, all that remains is just to say thank you so much to our guests and thank you to everyone in the audience who come along. Um, I hope you found it as useful as I have. I'm definitely going to be taking away a few different bits that I've learned. Um, we're also going to upload this onto YouTube. So if there are bits you want to revisit, um, that will be on our YouTube channel from tomorrow. Um, so I also want to say a big thank you to everyone who donated for their ticket. As a charity, we rely on the generosity of the public to fund the next mental health breakthrough. Um, so thank you for everyone who's donated. Um, also, double the reason to donate in May. Um, we've got a very exciting campaign running at the moment where every donation in May will be matched. So all gifts up to £100,000 will be matched by an anonymous donor. So your £25 donation now could become £50. Uh, so now is the time to donate and fund research into um, a, a faster diagnosis, a more effective treatment and one day prevention from mental illnesses. So thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed yourself. It's nice in the chat that it seems everyone's enjoyed themselves. And thank you to our guests. And I hope you all have a lovely evening.